It's good to be in the house of the Lord, Ed. Amen? Amen. And uh, it's good to be in church today. And of course, this is the last Sunday morning service of 2012. And uh, you know, many of us were here uh, on the first Sunday morning of 2012. Amen? And we're excited uh, that was able to start out and finish out. Amen? Uh, on Sunday morning. Well, I want you to turn in your Bibles today to Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter number 3. And um, I want to look at just a couple of verses uh, this morning. And uh, we'll pick up reading uh, along about, um, I don't know, we'll start reading verse number 7. But my text verses is going to be verse 13 and verse 14 uh, this morning. Uh, my title of my message today is The Best New Year's Resolutions. The Best New Year's Resolutions. Now, uh, I'll just go ahead and say I'm not for New Year's Resolutions. Most of the time that's just a bunch of hot air that people are spouting out. Uh, God is not in, interested, I don't think, uh, in our reformation. He is interested in our transformation. There's a big difference in those words right there. He's interested in our transformation, not our reformation. And much of the time, New Year's resolutions, all they are is a bunch of hot air. Now, you may have already made some and publicized and put it on Facebook and Twitter and everything else, and that's fine if you're in, into New Year's resolutions. I'm not uh, uh, mad at you, and I'm not belittling you. I'm just telling you my opinion, amen? And uh, I just believe that God wants us to be transformed, not reformed. And, uh, and so anyhow, I want us to look at what the Bible has to say. The Apostle Paul, if we could use uh, our modern day terminology and our ideas about resolutions, uh, I believe if the Apostle Paul ever recorded some New Year's resolutions that he would have, I think we found them here in our text verses. But let's start reading uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse number 7. He says, But what things were gained... To me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. You know the Apostle Paul is sharing his heart right there. As far as religious pedigree is concerned, the, for, the faith of his forefathers he held very zealously. But he had religion without Christ. And there's a lot of folks that have religion today, but no Christ. And he says right here, all those things that I had, I count them but dumb, that I might win Christ. The excellency of the knowledge of Him. What a, what a statement. Look at verse 9. And be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness. See, here again, uh, he's laying something out very plain. A lot of folk think they're going to get into heaven or think God's going to take a liking to them because of all the good things they've done in their life. Well, he says, Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. When we place our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we gain His righteousness. Uh, that's the doctrine of imputation. When you get saved, you didn't understand all this. All you do is use a hell-bound sinner deserving of hell and needed, needed to be saved. And so you come to God and ask Him to forgive you. Well, guess what? When God saved you, this is what He did. He took all the righteousness and the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ and He placed that on your account. Now, it's not unlike a bank account over here at Washington <laughs> County Bank where I have a few accounts, the church accounts over there. And, uh, you know, if, if you were to go in there and say, I want to put a million dollars in Andrew Shank and Shiloh Shank's bank account, that'd be a blessing, amen? <laughs> but if you were to do that, you could take your money, it's not mine, it was your money, and put it on my account. And I get credit for that, Amen? Well, guess what? The Lord Jesus' righteousness, all of His righteousness was placed upon us when we got saved. And so now God sees us not through our works, not through our uh, faults and faiths, but God sees us through the blood of His Son and through His righteousness. 
that was accredited to our account. That's a wonderful truth there in the Word of God. Amen. That'll make a Presbyterian shout glory to God. Amen. I believe it would. But we see here this morning that uh, in verse 10, he says, And I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, be made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, now, now look here. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that which I also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Lord, we love you today. Lord, as we look at our verses and we examine them this morning, we pray that you'd open our eyes, that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law. Lord, uh, if there's anybody here today without Christ, may this be the day they trust the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior, and in repentance and faith come to you uh, to be saved. We pray, Lord, for the child of God, that you would help us as we consider the new year. And uh, many folk uh, are passing resolutions and deciding and setting goals and different things, that they want to do some new things this year and all that sort of thing. And this is often an inventory time of our lives, a lot of People are doing a lot of heavy thinking right now. And, and so we pray that in the midst of all these things that we can glean a little bit from what the Apostle Paul had to say about the one thing he did each day in his life. And Lord, help us as we consider that this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I know the English here might be hard to follow when you come to verse 12 and verse 13. Uh, a part of it anyhow. But let me just put it to you in uh, layman's terms. What Paul is saying in verse 12, he says, I've not arrived. I've not reached the place of mis uh, spiritual maturity never to ever increase that again. Now, if you talk to some people, they'd have you think they've never sinned since they've been saved. Or they've been saved so long, it's been so long since they have remembered even sinning. I heard somebody make that statement one time. I said, boy, you ought to just think about what you just said because you just sinned right there. Amen. Total lie. And uh, all of us are going to sin to the day we die because we have that old Adamic nature. We understand that. We can have daily cleansing, though, from our sins. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But what Paul was saying here, he says, listen, I've not reached some superiority level of, of, of spiritual maturity in my life. Listen, Paul wasn't perfect. For some reason, uh, I, I guess it's just that child in us. You know, when we're kids that go to Sunday school, when we're kids and we learn about all the Bible uh, characters and learn about all these different men and women that God used in the Bible, for some reason, you know, and, and it's nothing wrong with this. We look to them as heroes. We look to them as some super person, you know. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? But somehow or another, when we get older, we begin to still look at them as if they've never, I mean, like they're perfect or that they are uh, some super spiritual person to be able to do some of the things that they've done. But Paul makes it plain. All his religious pedigree, all the good things about him, he counted as dumb, cow manure. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's, that's what he counted as. He says, listen, I've not arrived. I'm still a work in progress. Amen. I need to get me a shirt that says Andrew Shank and on the back, a work in progress. Because you know what? That's what I am and that's what you are. None of us are perfect. Now, I was thinking the other day, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I wished I never made another mistake. I wished I was just like you and I wished I never made mistakes. I wish I never hurt anybody. I wish I never said anything wrong. I wish I always preached a perfect sermon. I wish I could always sing the song and hit the right note at the right time and not be one or two ahead or back when, according to somebody's plan. Amen? I wish that I could uh, uh, do something and do it right the first time. That's just me. Maybe, maybe you're not like that. But I sure wish I could be a perfect Christian. But you know what? I'm not going to be one. Now, there's nothing wrong with trying. Not a thing wrong with trying. Now, a lot of folk, they just give up entirely. They, they think God's not interested in us trying to live right and do right. I think God's very much interested in us doing right. 
He says, be ye holy for I am holy. Amen. Uh, that's in 1 Peter chapter, uh, I think number 3, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but anyhow, uh, we see here that Paul is just making it plain, I've not arrived. I've not reached that level of perfection. But he says, this is the one thing I do. This is one thing I do. Now, Paul had a life that was uh, like a diamond. There was many facets to his life and ministry. Um, I don't know about you, but Shiloh and I, as of late, sometimes we feel like we're an inch deep and a mile wide. You know, you're doing this, running here, running there, doing this, doing that. And sometimes, you know, you just get burnt out. You just, you just get wore out from just all the things that we're doing. But Paul said this one thing I do. He was focused. He was determined. I, I really believe that what he expresses to us here this morning is something that he focused on every day in his life. He had not reached some level of maturity where he never had to worry about these things he's going to talk about. He said, this one thing I do, and I believe this morning as he talks about this one thing, I believe that we can divide that up into uh, three New Year's resolutions that if we could use that this morning. And I entitled the message, as I've already mentioned, the best New Year's resolution. Number one today, I believe that we should forget some things. There are some things that we need to forget. Now look what it says there in verse number 13. It says, this one thing I do. What does that say with me? Forgetting those things which are behind. Read that with me. Forgetting those things which are behind. Is that what the book says? Yes. Amen. Yes. Then why don't we practice that? You know, there are some things that, and there's a lot I can say about the things that we ought to forget, but let me just say this. Um, there are some things about yourself that you need to forget. Did you know that? Did you know there are some things about yourself that you need to forget? Now, you know, somebody described uh, humble when somebody's humble as being this. It's not thinking less of yourself is thinking less of yourself. Amen? Amen. And some people can, can really forget about themselves and they might get down to the ground of being humble. Amen? I mean, it's all about them and nobody else. Listen, you and I this morning need to forget some things about ourselves. Now, when we talk about forgetting, we're not talking about um, not learning from things and implementing things that we learn over this last 2012. This last year has been a great year. This last year, has, it, our family has faced, some great, has faced some great victories in our lives, and we've also seen some great defeats. We've experienced death in our family a couple of times this year. Uh, I, have, I know in my own life, I've had some great uh, victories over things in my life, and I've had some utter failures in my life. Um, but you know, uh, with, with all of the, the good and the bad in my life this last year, I, I think if I'll take what I have learned and implemented, but just forget about the failures, just, just put it behind me and walk on. You know, it, sometimes it's easy to forgive others, but you won't forgive yourself. And uh, you know, we need to learn to forgive others which leads me to my next thought here. I mean, not only should we uh, forget some things about ourselves, but we should forget some things about others. Did you know that? Did you know that there are some things that you ought to just forget about other people? You know, one of the biggest problems in marriage is, uh, is, is dangling some past failure over your spouse's head. Now, I know uh, I can speak from experience that when I get upset... Sometimes I bring up something that I perceive as a fault and I try to exploit that for my advantage. Now, y'all are all looking at me like, surely the preacher don't do that. Well, I'm a man, amen? <laughs> and we all do that, right? Right. Now, some of y'all are going to be honest. Some of you sitting there going to lie about it, amen? You can't tell me you've never done that. I'm going to tell you something. Y'all just forget those things. What good does it do to bring up somebody's failure? Do we think for some minute they've forgotten about it? 
Well, obviously they had not heard my message, amen, because they should have forgotten about it, amen. <laughs> but they've not forgotten about that. I mean, you, you cannot do wrong in your life as a child of God and it not stain you at the remembrance of it. The Apostle Paul, his name at that time was Saul of Tarsus. Saul stood there and held the coats of those that stoned Deacon, that, that great man of God in the book of Acts. He held the coats of those that went and stoned that man. That man never done one thing wrong to deserve being stoned to death. And he held the coats. And you know what? He stood there that day and he watched Stephen draw his last breath as a martyr in the New Testament. And you know what? I think to the day the Apostle Paul died, he never got over that. I think that was one of the things that God used to convict him in his life about needing to be saved. And that he had religion and no Christ. But I'm going to tell you something. You and I need to forget some things about ourselves this, this coming year as we enter this new year. And we need to forget some things about others. We need to forget the failures of other people. That's hard. When, especially when you're working closely with somebody. Somebody's uh, bad habits that just drives you insane. You know what I'm saying? It's like putting that toilet paper roll up on the wall. You know what I'm talking about? The paper is supposed to come over the top of the roll. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah! Right there. It doesn't go behind the roll. Amen? Or sit, on the, or sit on the counter right next to the roll. That's exactly right. Now, unless you got one of the newfangled things where you can put five rolls on a on a on a piece of pipe where they all sit vertically, that's different, amen. But uh, uh, you know, sometimes little things like that can be mountains. But we've got to learn to forget the faults and the failures of other people. We often want people to forgive us. And we certainly want God to forgive us, but we're very um, slow to forgive other people. And we can't be like that. I think that's a good New Year's resolution, don't you? There's some things we all forget. Number two, Paul says this. He says, reaching forth unto those things which are before. We should reach out for some things this year. We should forget some things, but I think there are some things that we all reach out for this coming year. Now, I don't know about you, but I like to set goals. Uh, next Sunday night in our business meeting, Lord willing, uh, we're going to try to set some goals for the church. Now, I remember, uh, I believe it was um, just prior to last year, uh, Moose and I were uh, riding around doing some visiting, and him and I had set some goals to pray about for the coming year. And we, I'll be honest with you, we come pretty close to it, if not reached it, for this year. But here's some things you've got to understand. Uh, if you're not aiming for anything, you're never going to hit anything. Amen. A man is never going to shoot that nice prized deer up at Ken Hansen's, amen, the one I missed last year. <laughs> you're not going to shoot that huge white-tailed buck. It had to have been a ten-pointer at least. I mean, man, when he breathed like a, one of them steam engine locomotives belching out air, amen, it was so cold that morning. I mean, that joker was huge, man. I, I don't know, I could got him in the back of a pickup. Now, you know I'm exaggerating now, right? But, uh, but you know, when it comes down, if, if you're never going to aim at anything, you're never going to hit anything. And there's a lot of people that they just muddle around their life and they never accomplish anything because they never set any goals. I don't believe the, the Apostle Paul was a type of person to sit around and twiddle his thumbs. I believe the man knew how to forget some things or try to. And I think the man knew what it meant to stretch out and to reach forth unto something. Uh, last year, I, I'd never been to a track and field event in my life. I've seen it on TV, but I've never been to one. And, it, and I know this probably may seem uh, to you guys who've been to them long before I'd ever been to one. This might seem small to you, but it was big to me. I went to a track and field event not too far from here when I drove the activity bus down. And man, my heart was blessed. 
Because I'm watching this track and field event, and I'm thinking about the Apostle Paul. And how he got to watch the FBN games and got to see uh, a lot of those athletes perform and win awards, a garland wreath placed upon their head. And, and that's all that they uh, were able to get. I mean, they, they worked hard in, to, to win that crown. And, uh, and how he used the imagery from that to describe the Christian life. And I'm up there and I'm watching and I'm thinking, man, I'm getting a lesson right here. And it blessed my heart to see those things. But I, I watched those, those runners out there. And man, with every step, with every stride that they would make, man, they're reaching forth. I mean, you can't run without reaching forth physically. I mean, that's how you're running. And that's what the Apostle Paul was trying to get across here. He says, I need to forget what's behind me. And I need to be stretching forth out to what's in front of me. You know, people that get hung up in the past never accomplish nothing in the now or the future. Now, you maybe can't divorce yourself from your past. But I think that the more time that you separate between your past failures and the now, the less that sting is going to be. Amen? And I think you can soon forget it altogether. But Paul says to forget some things. And he says to stretch out and to reach forth for some things. Do you have any goals for this year? Have you set some goals? Have you, have you sat down? Maybe you haven't written them down on a piece of paper and put them on little post-it notes and stuck them up on your mirror and all that sort of thing. Maybe you're not that away. You don't have to be. Maybe you're one of those folks that like to write in a diary. Maybe, maybe you wrote them down. I don't know. Maybe you haven't. But you ought to have some goals. And you're like, I, I'm just going to share some I'm kind of partial to. I think you all just set a goal to be in church whenever the doors is open. And that's providentially hindered. Now, I know a lot of times, um, you know, people get mad when a preacher talks about being in church, but I tell you, uh, when you get out of church after being in church, it's hard to get back in, number one. Number two, you miss out on a whole lot. You miss out on a whole lot. I'm going to tell you something. Uh, I don't know how I could make it if it weren't being able to come to church with you guys every week. I tell you what, bless is my heart. I look forward to coming. Man, something starts churning in my heart, man. When closer we get to Sunday, Saturday morning, Saturday night especially, man, I am nervous. I am excited. I am, I am anticipating coming to the house of God. Man, I get up early on Sunday morning. I'm getting ready. I'm getting prepared. I'm getting my mind together. I'm, I'm ready to worship, amen. Now, I don't just worship the Lord at church. I worship throughout the week. But man, be in the house of God. Be in the house of God. You can go fishing on another day. You can go fishing after church, but don't go fishing during church. Amen? If you're going to go on vacation, be sure you find a church somewhere while you're on vacation. Nothing wrong with that. Our family's done that for years. I found some good churches out while visiting on vacation. I, I mean, I've been blessed. I've made some good preacher friends. Never known before. Till I went on vacation and found this brother. I'm like, hallelujah, man. I know where I'm coming next time I come down here. You know what I mean? It's just a great experience, man, to be in the house of the Lord. But just set that go. I'm going to be in the house of the Lord. How about trying to be sure you read your Bible every day? That's a good goal. You know what? I, I wonder if, if there might be somebody this morning you have never read your Bible through from cover to cover. Well, mate, this, this is a good year to start that. Amen? If you read three Old Testament chapters, if you read... Uh, one psalm, one proverb, and one chapter of the New Testament. You read your Old Testament through one time. You'll read the psalms through a couple times. You're going to read the proverbs 12 times a year because it's, it's one a day. And then you're going to be able to uh, read your New Testament through two times this coming year just by following that simple schedule. I learned that not long after I got saved. And I'm going to tell you what, it blessed my heart. My pastor reads 10 chapters a day. He just... Chronologically, that's how he does. It. He's done that for years. Uh, to each their own. But man, read your Bible. Read your Bible. There's a lot of goals. A uh, tithe. Maybe you not give a tithe to. Them. Maybe just give, but not a tithe. There's a difference in that. I'm gonna tell you what. When I started tithing as a young man, God proved Himself to me. Let me tell you, God proved Himself to this young man. Uh, I remember uh, a lot of my friends, they weren't giving and tithing and stuff, and I started mowing yards and working on cars. And uh, I had a teacher in high school 
Uh, he was a Christian man and he helped disciple me a little bit. We used to have devotions before school every morning in the classroom, just me and him. We had a great time together. We, we cried and pray and read and just had a wonderful time. And you know something? He told me, he said, Andrew, here's what I do about tithing. He said, I get cash a lot with what I do. And that's what I did. He said, I just go ahead and pull my tithe out and fold it up, stick it in the corner of my billfold. And I just know on Sunday that's what I'm going to put in the plate. And you know what I started doing? I started doing that very thing. So I wouldn't spend my tithe money. And I'm going to tell you what, God bless that. You know what one, and I'm not saying that if you do what I did that God's going to do this for you. But in my case, God proved himself this way. I began to tithe as a young man. And in one year's time, you can ask my mama and you can ask any number of uh, several other people that knew about this, but in one year's time, God gave me four automobiles. I was able to fix them up and sell them to pay a bill at a certain time. Four. Clear blue sky. People come in the shop. Hey, I wonder if you might want to do this. If you'll um, uh, take care of it, sell it, do what you want to, and I felt impressed to give it to you. You know why I believe God done that? Because he wanted to make sure Andrew Shank knew, son, I'll take care of your needs if you'll tithe. That's holy ground with me right there. That's why I believe in tithing. I know it by experience. God will take care of our needs. Uh, maybe it's just spiritual growth in general. I hope that you can look back at the beginning of the year and look at it now and maybe see some growth in your life spiritually. Hey, we're all a work in progress, amen? But let's grow. Let's get some prayers answered, amen? Let's, let's try to win somebody to Jesus. Let's try to be faithful. Let's try to begin to exercise some biblical principles in our home. Let's clean up some things in our life. Let's, let, let, let's get out and serve God more this coming year. That's a great goal to have, amen? Reach forth for some things. Forget some things. And last of all, when we're done, we should determine to be faithful till the end. Now look what he says there. He says, I, I, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I believe that the context of verse 14, that high calling I think is referring to the resurrection or going to heaven. Okay, Either by way of the grave or the rapture, I think he's talking about that calling to heaven, that salvation call that he responded to. I believe that's what he's referring to. And you know what he's saying? He's saying, I am pressing toward that mark. Listen, the Christian life is not a bed of roses. It's full of twists and turns and battles. But I'll tell you what, it's the best road you'll ever travel. Amen? And I'll tell you one thing this morning. I believe we all are just determined right now by the grace of Almighty God that no matter what comes up in 2013, I want to be faithful. Amen? Be faithful to the Lord in your life privately. Be faithful to the Lord publicly. Be faithful to the house of God. Be faithful to read your Bible. Be faithful to pray and spend time with the Lord in worship. Hey, be sure that you're... Uh, if the Bible says, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Listen, I'll tell you what Great Commission Baptist Church needs. Some people that's got some old-fashioned determination by the grace of God. I want to be faithful till I draw my last breath. So many people you read about anymore, they, they start out pretty good, live a good life, and at the end of their life, it's, it's marked by disaster. They started out good, but they ended up bad. I don't want to be like that. I want to turn it around. Amen. I may get off to a rough start, but I want to finish out faithful. I want to finish out right. Nobody knows when their last breath is going to be drawn. Nobody. Nobody knows that. But I tell you what, we need to be faithful. Every one of you guys this morning can be faithful to the end. You can. You can. You can do that. Sure, it's going to be marked by failure. Hey, but you know what? Forget some things which are behind and reach forth. Hey, I messed up, but hey, I can take what I've learned and reach forth and do better next time. That's the thing I'm trying to get across to you this morning. New Year, the best New Year's resolution. Forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth under those things which are before, press toward that mark to that day you see the Lord Jesus. Amen? Keep pressing on. And I believe God will bless you. Nobody knows what is in store for us this coming year, do we? I hope that all of us are able to uh, win that sweepstakes. Amen? And 
at 40 million where you get a couple million a year on on time, you know, that'd be good, wouldn't it? It'd ruin every one of us. It would. It'd ruin us all. But, you know, I hope that this coming year, I, I pray this coming year will, will be a, a good one for you. Uh, I tell you, if I, as I look back and survey my life as a believer, I've had more good times than bad times. I've had more victories than defeats. And I believe if you'd be honest, you'd the same way. You might be facing a hard time right now and maybe a little defeated, maybe under the weather. Maybe you're a little discouraged this morning by the things that you're dealing with right now. But you know what? Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. This is always a special time of year for me because as I think about the coming year, boy, it's almost like I can just wipe the slate clean one more time. Just one more time. I just wipe that slate clean, start out fresh, start out this new year with a new vision and new desire and new determination to just keep on serving Jesus. I want to be found faithful. And I know that that's your desire too. But we can do it together. Amen? We can do it together. This, uh, the, the best New Year's resolution. Every head bowed, every eye closed.